Yeah. Hey, well, um, hey, great to finally catch up. It's great just to be able to have a chat really together. I mean, we're both in very similar situations, still in lockdown, very much so. And I don't know about you, but for me, the novelty is actually starting to wear off. You know, there was a stage initially I'm staining sheds, I'm cleaning ponds, I've you know mowed the lawns and everything. But it's sort of a stage now. I've actually missed the nipple contacts uh, and just the interaction with, with some of my nipple people. So how have you been dealing with all this? Yeah, well, uh, same thing, actually. I mean, um, had a couple of Zooms uh, with a few friends, but um, yeah, it's practically over it now. I just, <laughs> I think because we're such like social and outside people, you know, I yeah. mean, I love my home, but, you know, being locked down for about five or six weeks, it feels like now it's just, yeah, getting a bit willing. Yeah, it is, eh? Yeah. It's interesting. There's people ask, you know, uh, that obviously we're friends. And I said, yeah, we actually travelled a very similar path, both as players and also as coaches, which is really interesting. And whilst we don't want to sort of dwell on the past, uh, it was interesting, though, that we both started in 75 at the World Championships here in Auckland and uh, totally different positions. And I actually, I mentioned you once before and I thought you played wing attack, but then I found out you actually were the, the rocket in the centre, which was interesting. And I was playing goal defence in that tournament. So it was interesting that we both started our international playing career, you know, at those world champs. How did you feel about those? Well, I can remember you. I was scared stiff of you. <laughs> I was glad it was Margaret Caldo playing against you and not me. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I do remember that final um, at those Auckland courts because um, I can remember coming in and someone uh, in our team gave me a piece of chewing gum. And I never normally chewed on chewing gum but I think I was that nervous of I'm chewing away on this gum in the warm-up and your crowd was booing us in the warm-up so oh, I found that hard to believe <laughs> oh too right they were plus yeah. if you remember it was light light drizzle rain and um yeah it was rather funny because by the time we got into the game I must have absolutely chewed the insides out of this piece of gum and I'm on screen and the, at one time taking the um, centre pass, chewing like an old cow, like <laughs> <laughs> I think with the nerves going. And what a game. You know, yeah. We had to either win or draw it to win outright and we drew. Like, yeah. I mean, you, you couldn't have written a better script. These players, we talk a lot about... Um, obviously, the, the style of play, the Australian style of play, the New Zealand style of play. Now, these players from Trinidad and Tobago, um, Jamaica, South Africa, they're coming into your league. They're playing in your league for quite a period of time. Do you think that they're now starting to get more into slightly what I call the Australian style of play? Or do you think they'll go back to their countries and then go back to their natural style of play. And we want everyone to have different styles, obviously. I find that, um, you know, like you get, say, if you look at Kamwenda or even uh, Wallace, they're adding a different, well, and one of the bigger ones would have been Ramelda Aiken. You yeah. know, instead of just being the standing shooter now, they are able to set up a screen or, um, you know, come out of the circle, work the pass. So they're actually adding a little bit of value, I think, to their game. Um, in the uh, in the big picture, I think uh, they'll still go home and play their style, but um, and that will be how a coach will, um, I think, you know, put their their group together. So for me, with coaching South Africa, I mean, for me to get them, you know. Uh, Pumza Mawali, um, Bongi, um, Carla, um, Lenise Podgita, all of those players to get out of South Africa and play in, in an intensity situation had absolutely did so much for, yeah. for me as a coach because that's what I couldn't give them, not being there all the time and only going in maybe three times a year. And then there was others that actually got into the England League and it all came about after we after uh, 2015 because not many of them were getting a, a, an invitation anywhere. But once the rest yeah. of the world saw the quality 
and the athletic ability of these players, and then they started to really make an impact. That's when all the call-ups came. So I used to get a lot of calls from coaches about them and who they would recommend or, you know, they were, who they were interested in. I never I, – like I was like a manager, naturally certainly didn't um, – just purely on a helping situation because it was going to benefit myself to have these players out in those leagues. And I think, uh, yes, if I look back, I guess I'm Australian coach and I guess I did take South Africa out of delivering these long, long balls all the time. Yeah, in fact, I'd yeah. be all over them and keep the ball down and worked it low and hard. And I think um, <clears throat> they finally learned that... Um, you know, you yeah. could work a ball that much quicker by putting it down and, and timing the leads. That's one area in the game I that really bugs me. As I, I think I said the other night on a, a video link that I had was whoever bought clearing leads into South Africa, they had them clearing out of everything. The trouble was there was nobody there to take the next the next pass. So I had to had to make them learn to stand up and be counted right next yeah. to their opponent and take their leads off that. And it's the timing of the leads. Plus, I also think we overdose on the pass. We There's so many times it could be far more direct to the circle, but we don't hang in long enough um, to feed the ball in. It's like a hot potato. They have to turn around and whip it back and re-go yeah. again. Oh, it annoys the hell out of me. I, yeah. I just think you got to get the skill of the pass. Yeah. Uh, Aaron Berger finally was one player I felt really did a good job on that because, you know, she was centre. And Bungi uh, definitely got better at it as well, where Aaron was always wanting to put in the long bomb. And um, I soon showed her that the percentage rate of what came off of that was very low to working a ball to get in. To now, get you, in can, you can have it as flashy as you like, but flash yeah. doesn't win games for me. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting uh, with regards to that. Um, I went to South Africa many, many years ago, and they were they were playing that long, high pass. You know, and we talk about different styles of country, and they were playing you the high You mean you went ball. home? Sorry? You, you mean you went home? Oh, Sammy, Sammy, <laughs> Nate along, Nate along. Yeah. But also, you know, they did the big diagonal passes. And so, and at that time, I'd say, listen, that ain't going to work, you know, internationally. But because they were deprived of that competition, you know, until recently, yeah. until you experience it, you actually don't know. And at least some of your players, by playing in the Australian, England and New Zealand League, they did experience that. And we often talk about the different uh, styles of countries. And uh, recently, we actually held a seminar in, in England at the World Champs. And we came through, and it was really interesting. And I come, obviously, from New Zealand perspective at the New Zealand style of play. And, and Dame Nolan actually really wants to bring that back, and I, and I think that's wonderful. I think we, got, we had a period of time. We looked at Australia and we thought, yeah, yeah, you know, it's the fast speed, it's the hands over, it's the one-on-one -on -one marking. And you have a lot of success for that, and I have absolutely no problem with that. But part of our style, like on attack, it's the holding shooter, where we have a stationary shooter and the goal attack does all the movement within the circle. And it's up to the centre wing attack to bring the ball to the shooter. Defensively, yep, we like the space marking. We love, I mean, certainly I, I love going for a ball in flight. It's about taking of the intercept. So rather than doing the one hard on a uh, hard one on one on a player, we're looking for the ball. We talk about zones, and the zones probably we tend to use would be a high zone because by doing a high zone, even if it's broken, you still have an opportunity of taking the ball. So we work that way. So fitness wise, whilst Boy, it's it's a biggie now in our game, and so it should be. We're professional athletes now. Fitness has to be a, a huge component of it now. But, you know, we had some players in the team, and there was mention made of Vilimana Davu, and we've got uh, Kat Latu was in that team. And, and these players um, were not what you'd call the lean, mean type, but by goodness, you know, they were one. Kat was just brilliant in that goal shooting circle. She could hold like crazy. Irene Van Dijk, a lot leaner, meaner, but she was also very much a holding shooter. Other end of the court, the Vili Davus, she might not have uh, been the best on a yo-yo test, but she could read play, she could take the intercept. And I thought that was our style of play. So I look at Australia and I think it's lovely 
you still obviously retain your style of play, very much the hands over, you know, but you but South Africa, you didn't take that totally into South Africa though. You allowed them to have their own style. Do you, how do you see, if I say to you, what's the actual Australian style of play, how would you answer that one? Well, as I said, I it was for me it was um, teaching them that there's seven players on a court and um, how to use them instead of, you know, having dominant players in one area or more. They had to learn to connect better as a, as a team. And I still think just bringing that ball down low and hard, and we used to do a lot of systems with them because, and what I mean by that, I don't know if you call them just long court passings or, or what we call them systems from the baseline. Australia or South Africa? Uh, Australia. Yeah. So yeah. I was teaching South Africa uh, and I couldn't believe, you know, the lack of combinations they had from a throw-in from the defence end. So I had to, you know, teach them that there was other ways to use the, the throw-in uh, by how they swapped leads or, you know, who actually took the pass. And, um, you yeah. know, if it was on the goal defence side, the wing defence could take it, but it was how the goal defence was going to clear out, all that sort of thing. And it took quite a while. But once they started to get on how to work space, they became a very big threat as a team. Yeah. And I, I, you know, um, we hammered it. Like every session to finish off, we would do good 15 minutes out of our two hours 15 minutes um, of bringing that ball down because we had to have connection and that was one of the areas that they didn't connect that well and so once they all learnt you know how to work with their teammate it became so much easier as a group overall yeah yeah because yeah, I felt South Africa you had players in there brilliant on defence came through for the intercept and I thought yeah you know it's a mix it's not just a mixture of Australia and New Zealand but you've actually added to their own style of play which I thought was great yeah, I, it was one yes, of the sorry. funny yeah one of the funniest ones though was Carla Vittorius on my very yeah. first coaching stint against uh, I think it was Uganda we had Malawi and uh, Nambia at a, this was just before, like a couple of weeks before the World Champs in 2015 when they asked me to take them and I only had about, you know, six weeks. to. So they had this tournament on. And I can remember the uh, clearly the very first um, time I, I, I put them there and I uh, Carla was at goal defence and I asked her because I knew the goal attack from um, uh, Uganda was like yeah. quite nippy. So I said to her, right, I want you to sit on this player and actually work him. I said, yeah. I don't, forget about the specky. I said, I want you to be able to take her out of the game. Well, she went out on the court and she did everything but. She <laughs> roamed around everywhere. She did, yeah. And Uganda was well and truly in the game. So yeah. she came off and I said to her, well, that was interesting. I said, um, so I asked you to sit on this player because she's very damaging and she's doing the damage, but You've decided you want to play that game. Well, look, there's another defender on the bench Ooh. because I can put her on or do you think you can actually do this? And she looked at me because she didn't, like they didn't know how to handle me at all. Oh, wonder why. <laughs> yeah. And um, she went back out yeah. and she nullified this goal attack and she was outstanding and yeah. she was still able to come off them and get ball, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. what I was trying to get through to them, first of all, you've got to be able to, what I call, suppress your own player, make them nervous about passing the ball to that player, and gradually but surely, once you're in control of that, you will be able to go hunting anything you like because yeah. uh, they'll be nervous about what you're going to do next. So, And she finished up winning the player of the match. Mm. So they were had this... Um, 3,000 rand that if you were pick player of the match, you know, you got this uh, check. Yeah. So at the end of it, when she was, you know, presented with the check and she walked over and I said, outstanding game. I said, that was fantastic. But see that check? You owe me half of that because you wouldn't have got that if you had a still been playing <laughs> your game. <laughs> she actually started to see the humour then and had to laugh. Yeah, but, yeah, my yeah. God, what a player. I mean, I just felt so rapt to get yeah. such fantastic players 
and see them develop. And once they realise it's not only one way, which is what you say, there's not only one way. I, I, yeah. I you know, yeah. I think um, teams can still put on a zone. We we can do a, a sag back, whatever. There's all different facets, and I think that might lead us into where Australia goes from now on because we're waiting for announcement of a new Ooh. coach. Yeah. But, I mean, whoever takes over that team is going to have an extremely difficult time because. We do not own one gold medal at the moment, Yvonne. Yeah. First time in the history of the sport. Not a World Youth Cup, not a Commonwealth Games and not a, a, a World Cup. Yeah. So with that in mind, the next coach coming in has got a lot of work to pull back our uh, player um, believability in themselves yeah. to be able to pull that. And that's going to be a big job. So, yeah. But also other countries' perspective because... Obviously, New Zealand went in a low, and they had that over the last few years. And it got to a stage when teams took to the court against us, there wasn't the fair factor because they were beatable. And you can talk to, obviously, to your South African team. You know, suddenly it isn't about raw the ferns. And I think Australia is a little bit in that in that way now. They've had some losses to their, to their game. They've had chinks because we've always said a wounded Australian is going to come back stronger and stronger. And this was one time they actually didn't come back stronger so yeah it's going to be interesting to see who the next Australian coach is and I think we're all having our own little bits and pieces on this and uh, certainly um, it's interesting you look at obviously your franchise coaches um, and it, you know I, and I, I'd say right now and I actually don't know her coaching that well but Simone McInnes her name keeps coming up all the time I like her as a person I like her manner on the side of the court and I think she has a tremendous amount of respect from her players it's just a situation one does is she ready for the job in the respect that she hasn't had the vixens for that length of time so would she go for that and you do have a number of people I mean Vicky Wilson is no longer coaching Fiji she could put a name forward. Um, Julie Fitzgerald is always up up for the challenge as well. And in the background, I initially thought Sue Hawkins, because obviously we have a bit to do with Sue on that international coaching panel. But she's actually been out of the actual what you call elite coaching um, with a team aspect, so not sure where she sits on this. But, yeah, it's going to be interesting. But well, you're this also, is also Rosalie Jenke from oh, the Ivers too. Yeah, so, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, Apparently it's closed off, so right. I, so I don't yeah, think they're yeah. going to announce anything till about the first of August. So we've got a, a long wait to find yeah. out who it's going to be anyway. Yeah. So yeah, but there's a lot of people, a lot of people, um, and you know, I'm a, I'm definitely a Simone supporter. Um, I coached her from eight fourteen right through to her whole career. So, um, yeah. absolutely brilliant player. So I mean. Yeah, I think she's done a great job with um, Vixens and she's won that championship a couple of times. So, you know, and I think what we do need is someone that's been around the traps, knows what it's like to be in the crunch and be able to step up and pull it out and someone go, right, I've got to do something here if we're going to win this. And you want coaches that know what that's like and also players that can actually, um, you know, do that for you. Yeah. How do you see, like, okay, if she gets, whoever gets the head coaching job, how do you see, like, do you believe in having one assistant? Do you believe in having specialist coaches? Or how do you see that that mix? And I mean, nowadays, it's obviously, there's a lot of support staff involved. How would you see as the probably the best way, if you had the funding available to you, which obviously Australia, New Zealand does have, but the likes of South Africa, and certainly when I had Fiji, we just didn't have that luxury. Yeah, well, I mean, it took a long time, um, even in Australia, like I had to fight when I first took over to get a performance analyst. I mean, that was horrific, <laughs> you know. Yeah. It was like, what do you need one of them for? You know, every other sport had it, but not netball. So, um, you know, they've got a lot of staff now. Uh, sometimes I think it's a little bit overdosed on, yeah. on yeah. some staff. I think you can go too far. And for me, though, I, hey, um, I had three coaches that I worked with uh, most of the time, sorry, for first of all, I had Janie Sewell there to start with, and then um, I always brought in, say, a Rosalie Jenke, Nick Cusack, and um, Sue Kenny. And over the time, one of them would always be on the bench with me. So, what you're trying to do then is to uh, create 
you know, new coaches coming through. And um, also, uh, I like them there at the training sessions. Yeah. Because when you do the specialist stuff, um, you want to be able to break off into your specialist groups and you can't do it all. Um, nine times out of ten, I might have been handling more the um, uh, back-ended um, the defenders. Yeah. Even though I played centre all my life, but I was always a playing coach. Said, I think you said the other night you you wouldn't you'd hate to do that. Well, I loved it. I didn't have to wait a quarter time to tell them where to go and move. And I was <laughs> I just, them you have done that anyway, even just as a player. <laughs> yeah, and I loved it. And yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, you know, it it just gives the players. All the feedback from all of it all the time was they loved the specialist stuff because okay. so it would be technically high but physically low in that session. So yeah. because you'd be breaking it down. And, I mean, we had you in a couple of times to work with um, some of my AIS players and stuff as well. So they love that and they love to get um, or pick the brains of different coaches because you only need maybe one thing from that coach that yeah. you add to your game, which then really helps you and, you know, and, and takes you maybe to another level. Um, not every coach is going to give you what you want, but I'd say like the top coaches, if um, you have enough um, expertise around you like that and feedback, yeah. you're, as a coach, I'm going to set down that style of game plan that I want, yeah. um, you know, and, yeah. and it's been successful. So, you know, um, I'm not going to run into doing full-time court press or zone where that's not my expertise. I reckon I can set it up and play it, but I, sure. you know, I'm going to play what I know has been successful and still is for me, and that showed with South Africa. So I, I think you know, um, if you if you look at it, players love that specialist stuff, and the more you can give them, I think, the better it enhances yeah. everything. Yeah, because this year, I mean, actually, I was going to be quite busy this year with the Silver Ferns uh, cluster groups, and we did this last year, obviously, before going to the World Champs. Personally, I loved it. I loved going in, and obviously I took the specialist uh, defence, but it was team defence, not just um, with the in-circle at times, although sometimes it was in-circle. And it was it was cool. Like, Nolene has an overview of everybody. Uh, Donna Wilkins was there and, and also... Um, uh, Mark Foster uh, was there as well for the midcourt. And I thought, you know, we all had our own little sessions and it's a different voice and it's a very specific to, to that area. Then at the end of it, we come together and we just collectively all put it uh, together, you know. And so yeah. and in that situation, I think the coach of today, and because obviously funding comes into this as well, and a time factor because they are together a lot longer now than we used to have them in, in our day, but it's it's a situation now where the main coach has an overview and it's about them bringing all the different bits together, not necessarily her doing all the active practical coaching. And I thought that Nolan worked that really well. And same with Deb Fuller. When Nolene was obviously over in Suncorp, uh, Deb Fuller took charge here, and so she was basically saw the whole uh, the whole uh, concept, all the coaching uh, stuff coming together. And uh, I looked at that, and I'm going, yeah, that's that's the way that we should be going now. And I and I agree with you though. Sometimes we have too many people on board. Sometimes I look at it and just the stats that are collected, and I'm going, how much of these stats are you actually utilizing? In trainings, it's one thing, but when in a game situation, if a player, for instance, drops the ball three times, I think you or I as a coach, I think we'll remember it. So we don't. Right, we will. <laughs> yeah. So I don't think we need to see that on paper. I love it. I when someone would we say don't. to me, for instance, your wing attack's always going into the corners. And I'm going, yeah. And that's okay because she's not being, no intercepts being taken or she's not being defended, you know? And I'm going, yeah, it's a very fine line as to how many people you have on board, so long as everyone that is on board has an accountability factor. And I think at times that might have been missing in the ferns, uh, you know, previous to this, but now everyone has an accountability, including the players. You know, they now have fitness, like they've set levels, 
And if you don't attain those levels, and Nolan put that out there, if you don't attain those levels, you know, you ain't going to get selected. And the first time when I came in on it and I, I saw a bunch of players and they were sitting on the side and I'm going, what are you doing? And she's like, oh, we didn't pass the fitness uh, testing and I'm going did you know what it was and they went absolutely and I says then you deserve to be have your butt sitting where you are right now and every player bought into that whether they're in the team or in the squad they bought into that and they now know structurally what is required and I think players nowadays still need structure to their whole uh, situation I don't know in Australia whether you have uh, uh, a player you know the empowering the athlete which I believe in but surely you also need some structure to the whole setup. You only empower the ones that know the game. You can't put young, young players in there and expect them to get out of situations if the coach doesn't know what she wants from the, the group. Yeah. Like, you know, I often say, like, so, you know, when you're coaching, you've got to know what you want um, from your team or how your team's going to look. If you don't know that, how are you ever going to know if it's happening? You know, yeah. you've got to know, like, your whole structure of what you want. And, yeah, if you've got a, a, a bunch of players that are, um, you know, been together for, you know, seven, eight years or something and they're more mature players, I think you can just say, well, you know, well, this is the one thing we need to work on today. And then they basically, you've taught them all the options. But if they don't know all the options... They don't know actually when things are breaking down and they can't identify it early enough. Yeah. On court, you know, in our game, six goals is nothing can be turned over within a matter oh, of less than yeah, three minutes. It. You know, <laughs> yeah, you know, but that, yeah, well, yeah, well, I was six down at half time in the, you know, 20, yeah. 2011 in Singapore. So, and you know, I think within four minutes we were back level. So you, you can't you. you the coach still has to identify sometimes a lot of things that the team on court in the crunch at the time isn't picking up quick enough on. So if you hand hand over everything to them on court, it might not happen. You would hope that some of them would identify it, but I tell you, that's one of the things I've found that players don't identify when changes happened yeah. immediately to them. Yeah, so I find it interesting we talk about uh, reading the game and I sometimes ask players, what do you mean by that, you know, what is what is it? And I believe as a coach, and um, it's really cool now being on board with Nolene because I hadn't been at the high performance with an actual team for quite a period of time. And it was interesting and um, with that, what I, like, what I enjoy, and that's why with her specialist coaches coming in as well, we had a situation, we, we showed them lots of different things. And I do one-on-one -on -one defense as well. Against a team like Malawi, if you just did space marking, you're in trouble because all they do is short passes, they pass it back and you'd never get the ball, <laughs> right? So, but what, what the aim surely is, and that's what I certainly believe in, is that we want to teach them lots of different things, you know, lots of different ways of getting free, not just the hole, but the dodge, which is being lost from the game, you know, and, and the quick movement and everything else. Then at the end of it, you, I'd like to think the players would then turn around and say, okay, you know, we're now on court and not sort of say, for the first five minutes, we'll do a zone. No, no, read the game, see what's happening out on court, and if something applies, whether it's the wall or the drop or whatever, whatever applies, that's when they got to put that out there. And it's the greatest buzz I get as a coach if I'm sitting on the sideline and suddenly you see, for instance, a shooter doing this great roll or a dodge or whatever, you know, and she gets the ball in hand and the smile on the face it's just magic. And when yeah. like that come together, you know, I mean, obviously as coaches, we love to win. But for me, it's actually that performance to see them change up. One yeah, minute. But you've still had a hand in that. Uh, you Sorry? still had a you've still had a hand in that by, you know, maybe showing her that the opening's yeah. there for the role. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And it's just wonderful that they can pick it out as to when to utilise and when not. And I think obviously the the higher level of, of player and the more you've been out there uh, performing, it'll come uh, far more naturally. Some players will have it naturally, though, like a Timmy yeah, Parabelli, yeah. and I spoke to her the other day. She's just got that natural flair. And when I took Fiji, man, that was a tremendous learning experience for me. Loved it. But when I went over there, I had my own ideas. And, you know, I was a, quite a structured coach, to be fair. You know, we were going to do all this stuff, you know. But 
you've got to, and that's why I asked you about South Africa, you've got to stick to what they do. They are natural ability. They've just got wonderful, wonderful flair to the game. You don't want to take, take that off them. When they lose, and that's something I had to learn from them, when they lose, it means something to them. Absolutely, it means something. And, you know, they've, they've played to the best of their ability of the game. But five minutes after they come off the court, they're in the van singing away, going, next game, and they can leave stuff behind. And so they learn and leave it behind. And I was a coach and probably still am to a certain degree whereby I hold on to that. And I'm going, look, if you've had a loss, it needs at least a half an hour of mourning about it, you know. And it's um, it's interesting what uh, uh, how other players um, cite as to whether they have had success or not. Now, with a team like Fiji, were they always going to beat Australia and New Zealand? Well, no, they weren't. But that doesn't mean to say they couldn't have had success against them. And that was, that was a tremendous learning experience for me. And I really enjoyed trying to bring them all together and bringing that flair into structure and also control and discipline probably more than anything else. Yeah, well, nice. I think... You know, with uh, South Africa, um, I think Nick uh, <laughs> Nick Cusack was funny. She said to me, "Yeah, she said you're certainly a lot softer with this lot, Plum." And uh, <laughs> and I said, "Well, you know, I think we've got to tread lightly. They need to, firstly, they've got to learn not to be looking at you so scared and realizing that you're human and that you know um, that you'll support them." And uh, so, you know, yeah, I I used to nurse them along quite a lot in the early days but as we got to then starting to get up there and compete and uh, beat uh, some of the top teams or even get very close I think it was the last 12 months I said to them well uh, girls the honeymoon is over yeah. now it's time for the real oh. stuff if we're going to make any impact at Worlds I yep. said well, you know this is it you know uh, I'm not going to be um, you know sort of that uh, well, supportive if uh, I've given a direction and you've just thrown five balls out of court, that won't, <laughs> you will get the wrath of that. So yeah. you need to start taking the responsibility. And now, and I can remember we were playing at um, in, New, uh, in South Africa and uh, we were playing against uh, New Zealand, I think, and um, uh, the shooters actually all of a sudden stopped shooting and dishing out. When they came off the court, I actually first went to them because I used to let Nick handle them and I said, that's enough. Go to the post. I've had enough. Just get to the post. And they walked away and they said to Nick, oh, that's the first time Norma's got upset. <laughs> and um, so I kept this on then, you know, this is it. Now. Don't go soft. Don't go weak. We've given you everything. and it, it, But it did still happen at the World Champs. Um, on the shooters in uh, the game against Australia in the first quarter. I think we're out by about five or six in the first quarter. Next minute, they started dishing off. So I took them out behind the screens at the end of the first quarter and just said, I've had enough. Yeah. You know, you put your hand up to play shooter, shoot. You know, otherwise, we're not going to be in the ballpark. Well, yeah. you know, we only lost by two to Australia and they were just fantastic. But I think sometimes you've got to come down a bit harder but you have to pick your time. Yeah. So I think my times were, um, you know, I think from being around for so long, I think the timing was right on when I actually would give them a bit of a swift kick and say, that's it, get yeah. into it now. Yeah. But with that also, it's, it's also about expectations as well. Like it's interesting with the Ferns, when they went to the world champs back here in New Zealand, most people, the expectation was, please, we just want to be in top four. Then as they were progressing through and they were playing well and everything was going according to plan and suddenly they were in the semis, so suddenly it's going, hey, let's make it into the finals. And once we got into the finals, hey, it did. It became an expectation that they were going to win that final. So the expectations on Nolene certainly increased um, with game from game. And now, obviously, we're in a situation we can't wait to play Australia because the expectation is obviously that we're going to obviously win that game did you find because with South Africa when you first took them the expectation wasn't the same because the team wasn't right up there as far as competitiveness 
Uh, but when you got to the world champs, or even some of the games prior to that, suddenly South Africa is becoming competitive, you know, and suddenly teams like Australia and New Zealand had to show them a lot more respect and go, whoa, this team, you know, they're out here and they've got an opportunity of showing it on the scoreboard. So once you got to the world champs, was your expectation not just to make it top four, but to go as high as you possibly could go? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, I thought top four was realistic, though. I mean, I, I will have to be honest there, because we had to get over Jamaica, and uh, I knew, and we had England, so yeah. we really had a hard road. Yeah. Plus, we had Malawi. Not yeah. Malawi, we had Uganda. Like, and they were sixth. So, like, we really had a hard, hard run there. And so, um, as I said, though, we just went game for game. I know it's a bit of a cliche, but, um, you know, I would uh, do my homework on what I felt we needed for each game. And, uh, yeah. gee, they, they played it out fantastic for me. And, um, you know, they, they were just so disappointed uh, after that game against Australia because they knew they had it. It was only, like two little mistakes at that end yeah. bit that they didn't get across the line. But by the time we played England the next day, um, they'd given me all they had because, I, yeah. as I said, I had some players playing in a top league and were fit enough. Other players, half of the team, were back home, didn't even have an inter, uh, 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 yeah. super league or anything to play in. And uh, they were only running on fitness that the assistant coach could do with them. They, they really were lacking... Um, that, you know, opportunity to have played all that intensity. But yeah. in saying that, you know, they still tried their heart out. They were just so giving for what they they yeah. really, really want to go somewhere, South Africa, and get back to, to being yeah. where they used to be. Yeah, but isn't it interesting, like you said, with the players, and I noticed as well because obviously I was over there, but, you know, the players, their whole approach has changed as well. Like in the past, if they got near a team, and you were using Australia as an example, when they got near a team you know, in, 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 in scores, they were really excited. But now they're in a situation where they were disappointed because they felt that they had, they well, had. They knew they could have won. And they, yeah, and that was realistic expectations. Whereas you take them back like ten years, and whilst that's what they wanted, and I remember one time they came over to New Zealand, you know, and the first game, and they lost by thirty-two. And I went in there, and um, I just did some work with them, and I said, "What are your expectations for the second test?" And they says, "Oh, to win it." And I'm going, now let's have realistic expectations, you know, because 32 goals, you know, unless New Zealand's playing bad, that's not going to happen. And yet they were adamant, no, 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 your total focus has to be that you believe that you can win the game. And I says, well, no, no, that might be, that's an end result, you know, and you should be in a situation where you just, not just improve on the score, but in, uh, improve on your performance. And I found that really interesting. We had a real tussle with this and I'm saying, I still have belief in you people, but it's got to be realistic. And it was a situation yeah. where, you know, you saw the things that you didn't do well, so just improve on those, and then the score will reflect that. Now, they went into that next game, and they still didn't buy into it. They still think, no, 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 we want to win it. Well, the next game against the Ferns and the first quarter, and they were something like 14 goals down. And I asked the players at the end of that game, how did you feel? And some of them said, well, totally disappointed because we were never going to win it. And I says, yeah, but you still could have really improved your performance and got major out of it, you know. And it was really interesting to see their progression from there. And part of that, obviously, because they had the involvement in the Super Leagues and stuff. But to see that involvement and now what I call realistic realistic expectations when they will, went to the World Championship. And I think that's been developed over time. And it's wonderful to see their progress coming through. Jamaica, similar, but they tend to, they're very up and down, aren't they, in their performance? Yeah, and sometimes are. we look at them and we're so disappointed. And I thought they did move away from their natural style of play. Um, you know, they're very aerial. We've always known them to be very aerial uh, in their game. And uh, they went away from that. And uh, and they do have a lot of natural flair and ability. And I think that's starting to come back a little bit in their game. But I guess a bit like South Africa, 
limited numbers of players at the elite level to pick from because still I think some of them still go to basketball in America. So unless it's a, a year of Commonwealth Games or the World Championship, they're not going to be available. Um, and some of them obviously spend more time at our super our leagues, which are now obviously professional uh, paying competition, and that's where they're about, and understandably so. Yeah, I think though, by the fact that they are out, just like South African players now, that uh, they're going to get the intensity games, even, and and that yeah. will always hold them into good stead because, as you said, they are fantastic athletes and have this ability. Because I've always felt that, you know, they might have been in the states on their um, scholarships with basketball, volleyball, but they used to always turn up. Um, and and even if you go back to '99. Um, you know, in uh, New Zealand, well, they just got together after all being away, had about two or three weeks together and, you know, had a blinder against you guys, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, and I can remember watching even the one before that, 91, when they uh, Australia had first taken the International World Cup indoors and um, I was sitting behind, we, we had all the ex-Australian players together and we were sitting in a box behind and I think cricket was the shooter. And Australia only won that by five or six yeah. at the time. Yeah. And they were outstanding. And so you look at that and you think, well, if they were together off more often yeah. and if they really, um, you know, could pull some of that back, but it's the finish off, what was it that didn't let them get over the line? You know, and I just think it's been not being yeah. able to be as a... a as a group together for a long period of time, um, probably not having camps and everything else like we do um, yeah. or, or we were doing before we had a World Cup or anything, you know, that it was very limited time because I discussed it with Ovi Pitterman, you know, who was their former captain. And, uh, yeah, so so many of them were, were not in. And they had to do that to just to get an education, to get yeah. out of the country, to go to America on scholarship, and play these other sports, but they always came home for their netball. Yeah. That's why we always had the world champs in July, because that was when it was the state's holiday. And yeah. so many of the black countries were over there and that's their holiday time. That's why we all played then. Mm. I don't know if you knew that, but that was one yeah. of the reasons, because I always asked why did it have to be in well, July? Yeah, and we do. You know, it's all very well to say, why should we cater them? Hey, listen, we need those countries. Oh. You know, we also need them to be right up there. Right. I mean, we spoke 79, Trinidad and Tobago. They were right up there. And I know yeah. it was in their country, but they, you know, and we need these countries. I think it's brilliant. when, And I know, like you were talking about having that super league, but we still need that active competition uh, in that as well. I know yeah. time's going against us. Last thing, and, and I'm not sure how I sit with this, fast five. Where do you think it sits with the netball? Personally, I think it's a separate game. I love our traditional netball. Don't muck around with the rules. Don't have. Uh, I don't believe in the two pointers in our traditional form of the game, um, and we've changed it in that almost now. We do have unlimited, unlimited substitutions, um, and that's obviously because we didn't want the fake injuries, and so we now got a situation really where players can just come on and off the court. They certainly have to indicate to the umpire, but uh, you can bypass that and come on off the court. But I, I like, I'm traditionalist. I like our game the way it is. I love Fast Five, but I see that as a totally separate thing. And maybe we we pick different players for Fast Five than we do for our traditional seven-a-side game because it is different. I think it's different defensively, how you defend it, especially when they're having the two three-pointers when uh, it's the bonus system as well. You know, And I look at it and I'm going, some players are really suited for that game. Certainly Maria Falau, with her beautiful long shot, was very suited. Well, she was actually suited to both forms of the game, but some players are more suited to one than the other. I like to keep the both. I think um, it's, it's a lot faster and certainly people are involved and it's a real entertainment package. But I think I, I see it as two separate um, things. Uh, and oh, I You're finished? Yeah. <laughs> Your turn. I feel a lot better having said that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, all of the above. Totally agree with yeah. you on all of it. 
the one thing I don't agree with is that I, I don't think it's that much faster. I don't think it's that fast because all the balls are long balls. Long ball yeah. takes a lot longer to get there, mate. So there's a lot of running, you know. It, but to me, definitely, it's something to keep. It, it, it's an opportunity for other players, you know, to make an impact and play internationally and against other teams. But um, I, I'm not sure if the court couldn't be a little bit smaller uh, okay. to assist that game. Um I'd like to see that trial, actually, but um, I, I'm, I'm a traditionalist, man. There's no way known. And I'm not all up for the two-pointer in the traditional game either. Or right. if you're going to have it, it's got to be outside the 16-foot radius of the of the current circle. Yep. And it's got to be outside that, you know, if, you, if you're going to put in another one. So not inside our circle. It's got to be outside. Um, but, <clears throat> no, I... Um, I'm with you. I think uh, our traditional game is always going to hold us in good stead. I think it's far more exciting when you've, you know, you've got these teams going goal for goal and down to the line and the defensive work and the structure, the screens, all of that. None of that's in Fast Five because there's so much space you just keep running, you yeah. know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, very happy to see it stay. But, um, no, I'm not, I'm not one for certainly putting it over and above but I think someone said oh, I should go into maybe that's the form that goes into the Olympics well I would choke on that I can tell you now if that went in before our traditional game I think the traditional game has the right to go in to an Olympics if we ever get there yeah yeah I think part of that might be because other countries uh, could be competitive more so in the fast five set up than in uh, obviously the the seven aside. I don't know their reasoning for that. Um, but right now, but in the end, you know, like I always look at the Olympics. You know, as supposed to be the elite of the elite of the elite, right? Soccer send what an under twenty team. Yeah. Well, uh, why? I don't think that should be allowed. I'm, I'm definitely against that. That's not sending your elite, your elite, your elite. You Absolutely. Know? Yeah. Even some of the tennis players now, the top ones, are going in to play the Olympics. You know, like you know, Olympics is, I believe, has got to stand for all the, the the reasons that it was all put together. But you know, again, the same old thing. I think it's money talks, and yeah. uh, um, I would I would really be disappointed if our traditional game didn't go into the Olympics first over yeah. Fast Five, yeah. Yeah. being here for a few minutes. Yeah. Fair enough, yeah. All right, anything you'd like to get off your chest? Anything? No, no, no. Um, as, as, we got as, as I said, um, yeah, looking forward to see who gets uh, the next Australian coaching position. And, um, you know, I hope because um, I got banned, you know, from Australia a bit when I. You did? I, uh, yeah, I yes, when I basically um, said I was going to mentor Anna Mays when she was coach coaching England. Okay. which I was so disappointed about because, you know, I had, um, like, Mark Caldo coach England physically against me, Sue Hawkins coached England physically against me, Jill McIntosh was working with Jamaica physically against me when I was national coach, but I just was going to mentor her and got banned from going into any meetings with Nepal Australia. Um, they've certainly tried to come back to make amends on that now but yeah I wasn't happy when that happened but then once they did it to me they had to do it to all Everyone. the other coaches that were coaching like Vicky Wilson, Jill Mack, Johnson. Susie, even um, yeah. uh, Fitzgerald, you know all the, all the coaches that were out which everybody got very upset about because yeah. um, I thought it was a great thing. If I had all these coaches coaching the rest of the world, I thought it was fantastic that we were actually out there helping. Yeah, but I find, and, and we've all done it, I've obviously had an involvement with Fiji, I've had an involvement with South Africa long before, yeah, obviously you went out there. Jill McIntosh has been with Jamaica as well. And I find it's interesting. We're allowed to do all these things so long as these countries that we're involved with do not competitive, get competitive yeah. against our own. And I yeah. find that interesting. Now, you and I, we're both 
it's not just about our own country. It's also about the international scene. Surely we want to make that international scene the best it can be. And I think it is getting better. It was how long was it where it was just Australia and New Zealand playing, even at a world champ in the Commonwealth Games? The last one we've just had, it could have gone one of four ways, you know, that final game. And isn't that what it should be about? That's that constant yeah. competition, close contested games is what it should be about and I know our for instance our, our paying public back here when they look at the silver ferns in action heck yeah of course they want them to win but they still want closely contested games and they and the closer it can get look the double overtime games we're still talking about them and that's what yeah. it's about so I do find it interesting slightly hypocritical where you know yes you can do all this but just don't get too close to our own country oh, yeah. so, I mean, so, I was only I was only mentoring. I, mean, I, wasn't yeah. even, I wasn't coaching the players or anything. She, she just needed to learn about, you know, what it's like internationally and some of the loopholes you can fall into if you're not smart enough to it's know what's great. going on off the court, yeah. let alone on the court. So, you know, it was just that. So I was very disappointed yeah. that, uh, when I had the phone call to say I'd put in all my thoughts about how to keep Australia to the top and put it into a meeting and then, um, you know, to get the phone call to say, oh, no, you can't come in because you're meant and uh, And I think um, after now, though, once they've seen, uh, you know, that you're out, you know, helping the rest of the world, some of the um, people that come up to me and say, this is this fantastic. What you're doing out there for other countries is is the best thing. And so you you actually take from that and realise, no, I'm not doing the wrong thing. No. I'm sharing the knowledge. Absolutely, I'm, um, helping anywhere I can um, to make this sport better and to close a few gaps that I hope that you know will maintain for the future going yeah. forward. And and I'll keep doing that as long as I, unless you know, like. If I had an opportunity maybe to even be a selector for Australia or anything like that, well, I'd yeah. have to reassess naturally. Yeah. But um, I don't know if I'd have a chance of doing that. Um, yeah. They might still want me. But, you know, when, when you have so much knowledge and certainly internationally around the world of what's going on, you know, I don't think it would be a bad thing. But then, you know, the yeah, things things change and people want their own. So, And I can appreciate that. So that's fine. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm with you, and, and yeah, and we're doing it for Nepal as a whole anyway. So, because I, I got slammed years ago with South Africa, and I had to basically come forward to the media and explain myself, and I got angry, and I went, I don't have to explain myself. This is about international Nepal. On the day, South Africa actually beat the Ferns, but the Ferns didn't have a great game, and they acknowledged that at the well, time. They lined up with the wrong team, even I know the game. <laughs> you remember the game, yeah. yeah, and also certainly South Africa had Irene and Liana in their midst. Yeah. And I also think that New Zealand probably underestimated them slightly, you know. And yeah, South Africa in a position, I, nothing to lose, everything to gain. I, I had a you know? um, yeah. I had a night with all that ninety-five team in South yeah, Africa. It. Yeah, they had they had a a function for me to go to uh, to okay. one of the homes, and all all of that team came, and you know uh, they were a damn good team. And, they were um, terrific players in amongst that, yeah. and uh, there was also. Um, rap, you know, with the work I was doing with their players. So, um, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. I, I can remember because back then you didn't have interchange. No. So, unfortunately, if you put out the wrong team, you were stuck. That's it was, you know, yeah. How backward were we way back then, you know? So, I actually like the interchange bit because I think a coach coaches 12 players or 10, whatever you got on the bench, not just seven. So, I'm up for interchange. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I am too. Uh, and it's interesting because sometimes as coaches, it, it becomes a bit of a nightmare, you know, do you make a sub, do you not make a sub, you know, in a situation. And like a lot of coaches will make a sub for what I call negative reasons. They will make it because their team isn't performing, so they're looking for something else. It takes a brave coach, and I, I had my coaches that do it for a tactical change, you know, to try and put exactly. something out there and I enjoy that and yeah. you see that that's how it happens you know well, you know you never know sorry but you're in a situation uh, at the world champs that you had probably what eight players that were really yeah. of that international experience so you were limited whereas yeah, like parents were able to do the interchange Australia you see I think in that final game they should have made a sub
And I thought they did not finish off with the lineup that they should have finished off with. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, it is. And, and I think um, uh, now that you have the interchange, but, you know, you put your team out there and you never know, like for, for whatever reason, let's say, um, you know, we put uh, Natty Von Berto goes out on the court because I think she's my greatest centre, but then Temi Parra goes out and plays against her and she's having a blinder on her. Yep. So I have to make that decision if I'm how I'm going to change it. Or I give Nat all the information I believe that will turn that around for her. I would probably work that with her first. But that. if it was another player, you know, yep. they might have might be having a bad day. And, you know, you often know when players stop processing and often when that happens, then they're gone. What That's how I put it. They've gone. They're not, yeah. they, can't, they can't actually think because they're too much under pressure. So I would make that interchange definitely at that time. It's not always just to give everybody a run. Oh, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't work into change like that. But I no. think as a coach, I should have that right. And that's why I was disappointed when those rules came in that, uh, you know, even at the World Champs, I had to sit there. I couldn't make a sub. You know, I had to wait till the quarter time or half time. I couldn't call a time um, because, you know, it might have been I just needed to make a sub. But, you know, you, they had um, in Suncorp, they were having a, a minute and a half or two yeah. minutes break. Each each coach, we didn't yep. get any of that. So with the, you know those things annoy me that you we can't make international can't make rulings quick enough on on those things that the the way it's got to go through and all the rigmarole it's got to go through actually it doesn't enhance the game. So yep. I'm hopeful now that with the unlimited subs, is that now internationally happening or is it just SunCorp and ANZ? Well. No, it's it's still obviously for injury, but um, you, you're not going to check it out, are you? You know, and it's don't no, forget no, it. you're not going to kick it out. But yeah, but but, uh, but has it been passed internationally yet? Um, well, I think the ruling is now that it's not about unlimited sub. It's now that substitutions sure, can be made in the top thirty seconds in which to make that substitution. But there isn't the numbers on it. Um, but obviously, yeah, it has but is it the player that calls the player that calls the sub uh, calls the time has to come off and the other one go yes. off. Yeah, yes. still that. Yeah, yeah okay. absolutely. Yeah. Now I'm on that cap, um, you know, committee. I'll have to yeah. catch up with all these things. Absolutely. But I do sometimes. Don't worry yeah. about it because I'm not coaching full time. <laughs> and I think, oh, I'll catch up whenever. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, no, no. All yeah. right. Well, it's been great to chat. Um, really cool. You stay safe. And uh, I really do look forward to seeing us all on the side of the court at some stage. And, uh, yeah, I, I still hear the passion in your voice. I have the passion. It's been great just to have the catch up. And uh, <laughs> even though yeah. we're self-isolation at the moment. Shame, shame we haven't got a gig together somewhere, Yvonne. Oh, It'd be coach, hilarious. <laughs> oh, give me a coach umpiring seminar. I love him. And yeah, I, and I've said this in the past to someone. I'd love it. You set up something on attack and I'll counter it or vice versa at all. No, I mean working together. Oh, work. us working together? That, that would be Look great. To it. Anyway, all righty. Thank you. Hey, pleasure. Same to you. Chat to you soon. Yeah. Bye. Bye.